you're tuned to More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcasted live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator. And he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for almost 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, folks, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Good morning, East Tennessee, and happy Saturday. Welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. And my name is Kevin Craigenbrink. I'm filling in for Jim today. Uh, you're listening to News Talk 98.7 WOKI. And, uh, man, it is a beautiful day out already. What a, what a gorgeous-looking Saturday morning we have in East Tennessee. Uh, it's a perfect day to get out on the lake. And, in fact, uh, getting out on the lake is exactly what we want to talk about today. You know, uh, if you want to capture the beauty of East Tennessee, if you just want to drink it all in, so to speak, no pun intended, uh, there's really not a better place I can think of uh, than out on the lake this time of year. Uh, The the lake draws visitors from all over the country to East Tennessee. uh, And and getting here to go, whether you're going to go fishing or boating or swimming or you want to go on a sunset cruise with, the, with some friends. Uh, whatever it is that you want to do, getting out on that lake is just one of our favorite summertime activities. Uh, I mean, I confess I love it. Uh, uh, I happen to have access to a boat that I'm going to talk about a little bit later here in the show. Uh, I love spending evenings and, and weekends just taking it all in, seeing the sights, uh, enjoying the, the, the peaceful times on the water. Uh, and, and, you know, as I get out there and, and spend my time on the lake, uh, I, I look around, I see boaters everywhere of every different shape, size, and variety. Big boats, little boats, fast boats, slow boats, uh, tritunes, uh, house boats, sport boats, uh, yachts. It's all out there on the lake. Uh, and you can see people uh, enjoying the water, skiing, uh, uh, you know, getting pulled on their tubes, uh, swimming. Uh, you know, just putting out the anchor by one of the sandbars, all of those sorts of things are, are just part of what makes our lake such a great place to spend time. Uh, now, to, to, to get that conversation really focused today, I am really excited uh, that I'm joined on the show this morning by Scott Payne, who is the owner of the Nautical Boat Club at Concord Marina. Uh, and Scott's a great guy. I've known him for, uh, for several years now. Uh, he grew up in West Texas. Uh, where I happen to have visited a time or two, and, I, and West Texas is awfully different from East Tennessee. Uh, there's a flat terrain and very little water in West Texas. Uh, and uh, as Scott tells the story, after visiting friends in Knoxville, I fell in love with the, the region and the people. And, uh, and now that he's here, he gets to enjoy uh, Tennessee lake life almost year-round because his job puts him on the lake every day. So, uh, Scott, welcome to the show. Hey, good morning, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Man, you are so right. We, uh, in my opinion, we live in a water lover's paradise. I mean, it's uh, you got eight lakes within 50 miles. It's uh, it's amazing here. Yeah, coming from West Texas, I tell people this is uh, this is like Narnia to me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Like Narnia, that's a pretty good way to say it. You know, and, and yeah. it's, you know, the, the lake is uh, one of the draws. You know, the lake is the mountains. Certainly, there's no question. Uh, the Great Smoky Mountains are beautiful, and there are an awful lot of people that come here for the Great Smoky Mountains. Uh, you know, the the, the tourist uh, attractions in uh, in uh, Gatlinburg and Pigeon, Pigeon Forge and Sevierville area Absolutely. also a big draw. But no question in my mind uh, that the lake is is one of the most attractive features of our region. And so uh, you know, it, it draws lots of people here. But you know, Scott, I, I just let me ask you this thing. You know, what do you think are the biggest? What's the biggest change? from West Texas to East Tennessee? What, what, what's so different here? You know, Kevin, the, the people here are – Texas and Tennessee are, are so similar. I mean, the people here are just so friendly and everything. But, you know, coming – like you stated, coming from the desert of West Texas where, where there's no water, no mountains, no trees, 
Um, there's some beautiful parts of Texas, just where I was from. It's, it's not. Um, but man, just <laughs> like you just said, you've got so much outdoor activity here. I mean, it's endless. You could live here for 50 years and not touch all of it. So it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So, all right, cool. So, so you came here and, uh, and you started up this nautical boat club. And, and by the way, full disclosure, folks, uh, uh, Scott started the nautical boat club in, uh, in uh, 2017. And I actually became a member of the nautical boat club in uh, 2019. So this is my second year. Uh, I'm, I'm just finishing my second full year as a member of the Nautical Boat Club. So, so I do I do know a little bit about what they're doing over there. We get to talk about that some more in just a minute. Uh, but when you started that, you know what what inspired you? I mean, what was what what need did you see that said, yeah, I want to do the boat club thing? Yeah, I mean, Kevin, I grew up, believe it or not, living in the desert. We drove about two hours to get to get to the lake, um, but. And that was on the weekends during the summer. But, man, those are some of my fondest memories, some of the specialist time that I had, you know, with my family, with, with friends. My dad was an entrepreneur, so he was extremely busy. But, man, when we got to the lake, it all went away. I mean, we just let go. And, and you don't have to be doing anything. Yeah, you can be surfing, skiing, fishing. But, man, just just sitting by the water. You know, I tell people when I can see the water, it's, it's well with my soul. So it's um, and and to, for us to be able to to help people do that in a, a more convenient and more affordable way um, to, you know, we we provide boats, we provide water toys, but but the why we do it is to to get families and friends together to get them away from the devices and and all the distractions and just enjoy each other and and the creation around them. Yeah. Cool. So. All right, so so boating is wow, it's so cool. I, I love it, uh, and, and there's a lot of pieces to that. I, I think sometimes you know the idea of buying a boat is almost kind of like you know the idea of buying a car, right? Uh, there are so right. many options out there and so many things to think about, and you have to consider whether you want new versus used, and maintenance and storage, and blah 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 blah. So. And there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle. I, I, I want to pick them apart a little bit, and if you can help me do that, Scott. So the first part Absolutely. I want to look at is if, if you talk to me a little bit about, all right, I'm in the market for a boat. What mm-hmm. are the questions I need to ask myself? I'm going to buy a boat. Uh, what are the things I should be looking for? What are, the, what are the most important questions to ask myself? You know, to me, first of all, is how are we going to spend our time on the water? I mean, what do we really enjoy doing out there? I mean, is it is it is it just cruising? Is it cruising to the, you know, to a restaurant on the water and having dinner, or I mean, do we want to? Are we are we hardcore fishing? Are we you know are we surfing? Are we wakeboarding? Because as you said in your intro, I man, you see all sorts of types of boats out there. But man, you buy one, and most of them are pretty specific to certain things so you know you want to keep in mind what are we going to do you know how, what's our crew going to look like how many people are we going to have on the boat i mean that, you know that of course the size of the boat so there's so many factors that they come into that it's, it's it's hard to nail it down yeah uh, so you, you prompt me to ask this question so okay help me figure this out a little bit um Without without trying to I mean, I, I, there's probably way too much detail to answer this question simply. But but if I ask it this way, what would you say are the most common types of boats that we see on our on our local lakes and rivers? Sure. Yeah. Of course, you're going to see you know your typical pontoons or or tritoons. You're going to see um, sport boats or bow riders is another term for those. And then you you know you also see your your wake boats. So those are kind of your three common smaller boats and then you get into your your cabin cruisers and you know the bigger boats house boats but your m- most of your you know the majority of people are looking at either trots and bow riders or or wake boats okay so so i'm 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 i'm, I'm still sort of a novice to the boat thing uh you know uh, even if, even after two years of club membership i i kind of know what the differences are but i'm going to talk through that i want you to sort of make sure I'm right and, and help people that, that are listening sort of get the difference. So, so the pontoon slash tritune thing is pretty easy to understand. That's a, that's a big flat uh, sort of boat that you can put lots of people on and, and, and you might, some people might call it a party boat or something like that uh, where you can, you know, just sort of hang out and, uh, and, and have eight or 10 people on the boat with you. Am I right? 
That's right. I mean, your your pontoons and your tritoons are a good larger group boat. I mean, because they're going to be a, you know, typically a capacity of around 11, 12, 13 people, and they can seat those people comfortably. And um, you've actually got the, yeah. you know, the furniture on that boat to, to be comfortable where, you know, a four boat may say that it holds 11 people or a bow rider may say 11 people, but man, you're going to be sitting in laps if you've got 11 people on that boat. So you're right. I mean, it's a good, good big group boat. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, so then the, the difference between sport boat slash bow rider, as you call it, and wake boat is an interesting piece. And, and I want to dig into that a little bit because I struggled with it at first. And, and maybe a lot of people don't, don't recognize what that difference really looks like. So what I want to do, yeah. we're, we're going to take a real quick break here. And when we come back, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between uh, the, the sport boat and the bow rider. All right. So uh, we're going to take Absolutely. this break. You're listening to uh, More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI, and we'll talk to you in just a minute. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm Kevin Craigenbrink, your host today, filling in for Jim Brogan uh, while he's out taking a little time with his family. Uh, and I'm talking with Scott Payne, uh, the owner of Nautical Boat Club here in Knoxville. Uh, we're talking about getting out on the lake. And, and uh, Scott, I was talking about the difference between uh, uh, sport boats or bow riders and uh, and then wake boats. And so uh, here's my understanding. So I, I, I describe it this way. You tell me if I'm close. A sport boat okay. is what I always, when I was growing up, I always thought of those as a ski boat. That's the one if you're, you're going to go water skiing uh, or you've got one of those big tubes that you want to pull somebody on or whatever, that's the one you typically would see people using for that kind of activity. And then the wake boat is the one that if you wanted to go surfing on a surfboard uh, uh, and, and that kind of thing, that's the one you use for that kind of activity. Is that a good way to sort of think of the differences? Yeah, you're exactly right, Kevin. I mean, one of the things that I would always point out, the difference between, say, a sport boat or, or a bow rider and a wake boat, you know, a sport boat or ski boat, as you just referred to it also, is it's designed really to skim across the water and not necessarily to displace a lot of water. Where a wake boat is designed their their essence is to to sink into the water and displace water to make a larger wake or wave and like you referred to surfing you know when you're surfing you want a big wave to to get into the push of that but when you're skiing and you're cutting back and forth and just having a blast out there you don't want that big wave big wake i mean so a, a ski boat is designed really to skim where a wake boat is designed to to plow i kind of could compare a wake boat to a, a John Deere, I mean, a, a tractor. It's designed to sink in and just plow through the water and displace water. Yeah, cool. So, all right, here, now here's something that I, I just recently learned this is, uh, you know, uh, boats, boat, I say I recently learned this. It's going to sound silly when I say it. Boats are expensive, um, and uh, <laughs> yeah. especially if you're going to buy a new boat. Uh, I mean, the dollars and cents that go with this kind of crazy to me. I mean, I, I've seen some boats at boat shows, and and by the way, you're at a boat show today. We're going to talk about that a little bit uh, l later in the show. But uh, if you go to a boat show, uh, sticker shock can really drive you crazy. And, and even like we have some great boat manufacturers locally. Uh, sea Ray is yep. here, Malibu is here. Uh, but but okay, so so boats are expensive. Boat ownership can be expensive. And deciding if you want to buy a boat or just have access to a boat to a boat club can be really a, a sort of a, a, a groundbreaking decision-making process. So here's what I want you to do. Tell me a little bit about uh, the difference. Why should, what, what's, what's the advantage to uh, boat ownership versus boat club? What's the advantage to boat club versus boat ownership? Tell me that part of the story. Sure. Yeah. So there's, as you said, there's some give and take on, on owning a boat versus being uh, or rent, renting a boat or joining a boat club. I mean, you know, owning a boat, the, the positive is that, you know, it's your boat. You can take it when you want to. You can stay out all night. You can you can stay out there for days um, where it's it's your boat. I mean, you can do what you want to when you want to do it. But, the, you know, the flip side of that is it's your boat. <laughs> it owns you in a lot of ways because you're having to maintain it and clean it and store it and 
you know, a day on the water is not just a, you know, your time on the water. Now you've got to trailer the boat if it's not at, at a marina. So you got a, an hour at least of trailering the boat, getting it out of storage and on the water. And then at the end of the day, you know, covering it back up, loading, you know, loading it back up on the trailer, getting it back to storage. Um, so it, there's some inconveniences there. Um, you know, a boat club, of course, you're, we take care of all the the storage, um, the maintenance, the the cleaning, the upkeep. I mean, you arrive, you get on the boat, you go play, you come back in, you get off the boat, you go home. So you don't have the, you know, all all the stuff on either side of it. But you know, with a boat club or with rental, you know, you're you're you got a, a set time period that you've got the boat. So you know, you can't can't take off at nine o'clock at night and stay out all night. Um, you can't, you know, you want to plan ahead when renting or when when joining a boat club. You can't just spur the moment, go jump on a boat. Um, cause you've got other, you know, other, uh, people using those boats. So there's give and take to, to both of them. Um, and you really just got to look at, you know, how are we going to use it? How much time are we going to, you know, spend out on the water? For instance, with the boat club, I mean, you've got a, a six hour time period typically that you have the boat, which man, six hours out on the boat in the sun, it's a lot of time. I mean, it'll, it'll wear you out. So you, you just got to kind of look at what, what's our time going to look like? How are we going to use it? Well, that makes that makes a lot of sense, and of course there are there are obviously the cost factors as well. So you know, uh, um, uh, and, and you know, I, I, without being too specific, it seems to me as I've looked around, you know, if I was thinking about the price range for boats, uh, I see them as you know maybe you know depending on what kind of boat I'm buying, somewhere between uh, thirty thousand dollars on the low end, all the way up to I've seen them for. Uh, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and maybe even more. Is that is that right? I mean, is it are they really that expensive? They are. I mean, and you're right. I mean, you can you can find them on the low end around thirty, and and man, some of these wake boats go up into the two hundreds. You know, um, so there's a huge range there. But you know, your average boat that you see out there on the water, if you were to kind of average across a tri tune, a sport boat, a wake boat, you know, you could say that the average cost of those boats, man, is somewhere in the sixty, seventy thousand dollars. Um, so it's, and that's a huge investment. I mean, you compare that to my first house that I bought was $39,000. <laughs> I could buy two <laughs> houses for what I'm paying for a boat. So there is a huge, yeah, a huge range there. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. It, it is, it is like, like buying a, a new luxury automobile in many ways, isn't it? It is. And, and they've got some awesome yeah. features. I mean, they just keep getting better and better with the things that you have on them. Um, so it's, yeah, <laughs> it can get expensive though. All right, so so all right, so talk to me a little bit about this. All right, so I let's just say, uh, and this is whether I've decided to buy a boat or 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 get a boat through the boat club or rent or whatever, right? Uh, I got mm-hmm. a boat, but I want to go out on the lake and have fun. What are the what are the accessories I should make sure I've got with me? What are, what are the things uh, that I need to make sure I have with me on the boat? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's another thing that goes into buying a boat is you don't always figure in that additional equipment that you need to really, for one, for, from a safety aspect and two, from a fun uh, aspect. I mean, you've got to, I mean, you can very easily spend, you know, another couple thousand dollars on, on life vests, on, on tubes, on, you know, skis, wakeboards, anchors, dock lines, fenders. I mean, just the equipment that you really you know, even take the fun out of it. I mean, you've got certain equipment that you have to have on the boat. You must have enough life vests for, for every person on the boat. Um, you must have a, you know, a, a type four throwable or safety device. You have to have a, you know, fire extinguisher. Um, you know, those things just add up and, and, you know, add to that additional cost. And then, of course, you get into the water toys and, man, those can go from, you know, a tube being two to 300 bucks. And then your surfboards and wakeboards can go up into the thousand dollar range. So, it all gets very expensive, um, and then of course, like you were saying, you gotta if you're gonna own one, you gotta figure your store it and and all these additional things that go on top of the boat. So the boat is just the first step in in that whole process. Got you. All right, so so I'm getting ready to take that first step, and I'm thinking about this, and I've been hearing these rumors, Scott, that that right now today. Uh, and maybe maybe it's because of COVID nineteen and, and all of the stuff that happened uh, over the last uh, you know eighteen months or so. But I, I'm hearing that there is a shortage of available boats and marina space. Is that correct? And, and what do you what, what's your take on that? 
You are entirely correct, Kevin. I mean, if you you talk to any any boat dealer, even that's at the the boat show that we're at today, I mean, they are struggling to to even have enough inventory to sell. I mean, these boats that came in, you know, the 2021 models were already sold in in 2020. I mean, at the end of, of last year, or beginning of this year, they started taking orders and. And you know we're even us as a boat club. I mean, it's it's been a battle to to even find inventory um, to keep you know growing the club. And it's it, there's a lot of I think contributing factors to that. Just demand. I mean, boating was something that you could do through COVID. There was no COVID restrictions on boating, so a lot of people that couldn't travel, could you know couldn't go on vacation, couldn't do the things that they normally do, went out and bought boats, and that's what they're doing now. So even that's carrying into you know 2021. So you just got a ton of demand on on boat purchasing, and then of course when you purchase a boat, like we said, you got to find somewhere to store it. So then the next thing is the demand on storage, and and these marinas are they're full. I mean it's it's hard to on a, a lot of the lakes around here, it's hard to find a marina that has any space and doesn't have a you know a two to five year waiting list on slips. So it's a it's a battle. Right now, it's a, it's a fun industry to be in, but there's challenges just like with every industry right now, just, you know, according to the last 18 months, what what things have gotten turned upside down. But it's it's been interesting yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, and that is interesting. And, you know, it sort of it sort of prompts me to ask a couple of other questions that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll maybe try to get to uh, as the show goes along this morning. You know, one thought I had is, as I'm listening to you describe that, is that, you know, I, I, I sort of wonder what the – what the resale market looks like right now for boats. And that might be just an interesting thing to talk about. But the other thing uh, that you, you mentioned earlier, Scott, and, and uh, we're going to get ready to take another break here in just a couple of seconds. But uh, when we come back from this next break, what I really want to talk about is uh, boat safety and, and, and water safety and some of those other things that, uh, you know, if, if we do get out there, if we buy that boat, we get it all put in the water and we figure out how we're going to make that happen. How do we make sure that we stay safe out there? So we're going to take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we'll talk with Scott some more about being on the lakes. You're listening to More Living with Jim Brogan, only on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Thanks for tuning in to More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm Kevin Craigenbrink. I'm filling in for Jim today. And we are visiting this morning with Scott Payne talking about uh, getting out on the water and having a great time. But before we get back to Scott, uh, we're going to go to dollars and cents with Jim Brogan. Want to be sure you are getting the most out of your retirement? For all the years of your retirement? That's the primary goal of More Living with Jim Brogan and our Dollars and Cents segment, where we provide you with an important financial tip that will help positively impact the quality of your life in retirement. And now, here's Jim with this week's Dollars and Cents tip. What is the most important election you will vote on in retirement? For most, it is your Social Security election. When will you turn on income from Social Security? Will you delay? Can you afford to delay your benefit? What is your income need from your investments if you do delay? What about spousal benefits and widow benefits? Now, one interesting statistic is that in the last 20 years, uh, according to a recent research that was done by the Senior Citizens League, With cost of living increases, Social Security has, from somebody 20 years ago drawing Social Security, even with their inflationary increases, they've lost a third of their Social Security income because of inflation. In other words, retirees' real inflation, what you spend day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year, your costs are going up much more than the cost of living increase with Social Security. So what that means is you need an income plan that can account for the inflationary effect against Social Security. Now, one way to do that, 
is to delay Social Security benefits because you get an 8% per year increase in your benefit if you delay, and you can delay all the way to 70. The problem is you may not be able to afford to delay. You know, if you need a retirement income and you're delaying Social Security and you have to gut your savings to get you to age 70, that's no good either because one of the critical components of income planning for retirement is to know that you don't gut your savings too much in the first five to ten years because you need that money to maybe last for 30 or more years. So you just can't gut the savings. So not everybody can afford to delay. You also have to consider spousal benefits and widow benefits. And if you were married for more than 10 years, you're automatically qualified for the same spousal and widow benefits as if you were still married. Now, if you remarry, you lose that. That could be part of your planning strategy as well. The big thing here is your Social Security election becomes critical. And over time, once you are drawing Social Security income, Based on the past and where we're headed, I do not expect your, in, your cost of living adjustments to keep up with inflation. They have it in the past, and I don't think they're going to be in the future. At Brogan Financial, when we illustrate future returns and future income and expenses and needs, we assume Social Security increases to be about half of what inflation is going to be in the future. So that means over time, you've got, to, you've got to become more and more dependent on your own investments. And that means you need growth to fight inflation. But yet in the meantime, in the short term, you need stability of income. So how you put your income plan together to account for the inflationary effects and how your Social Security strategy folds into all of that is critically important along with all of the other things that come up with comprehensive retirement planning. If you would like to have a Social Security analysis or an inflationary analysis of your income plan for retirement, feel free to give us a call, 865-862-6800, or you can sign up for a complimentary consultation through our website at broganfinancial.com. We would love to see you and talk to you soon. That's our Dollars and Cents segment for this week. You can find this week's Dollars and Cents segment and others by visiting BroganFinancial.com. Thank you, Jim, for that Dollars and Cents tip. Uh, to follow Jim or learn about his upcoming adult education at the University of Tennessee or Pellissippi State, uh, go over to BroganFinancial.com and click on the link for classes. I hope you get a chance to do that. I'm going to get back to Scott Payne this morning. And, uh, Scott, I want to talk about uh, some safety questions on the lake. And I'm going to start with this. You know, I used to think that uh, that you know, driver's licenses for boats were not required, but, but I, I think I heard you say that that rule has changed. Talk to me about the rules for getting a driver's license for boats. Yeah, and, and there's kind of two answers to that question, Kevin. I mean, there are there is a requirement for a boater's license or boater's safety course in which um, if you were born after January 1st of 1989, so after January 1st of 89, you must have completed a boater safety course and obtained a boater safety certificate in order to operate a boat um, on, you know, Tennessee waterways. But if you were born before that date, you don't have to have that certificate. But, you know, I would encourage and recommend anyone boating, anyone buying a boat, take that safety course. I mean, because there's so many rules to just like you wouldn't get in your car and, and, and start driving without having, you know, at, at 16 years old or whatever it is now, you wouldn't just go because you don't know the rules. You don't know the right of ways. You don't know, you know, all those things that keep people safe and, and keep things flowing smoothly. Well, that course teaches you those things. It teaches you the laws. It teaches you, you know, who has the right of way, um, how to be safe, what to be looking out for. So it's a, you know, it's, to me, it's a very critical component of boating. Um, don't just buy a boat and go. I mean, learn, learn the things that you need to learn first. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's good advice, and, and I appreciate that. I, I know uh, I appreciated when uh, when we joined the boat club. You gave us a, a course on on boat safety and, and boat operation and the rules of the sort of the rules of the road for the lake and those sorts of things. And that was pretty cool. Right. I'll tell you the, the one thing, God, I remember this, uh, uh, clearly, uh, I, I had always, you know, I, 
I've been on the lake before with friends and others, uh, and you see the buoys on the lake. And, and I always knew that there were green ones and red ones and blah, 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 blah. Uh, I just never really knew, you know, what, what those buoys meant uh, and how to know if I was on the right side of the buoys, if I was in the right place or not. Uh, and so uh, you, you, you told me that little thing, red, right, returning, which means if I'm going right. upstream, I've got to keep the red buoys on my right. That's right. So, that so the return okay. part of that, yeah. So, the return part of that is is when you're returning to the source of the water. You know, like on our our waterways here, they're they're pretty much rivers. So, as you just stated, when you're when you're going upstream, you're returning to where the water's coming from. So that's that red yeah. right return. Red should always yeah. be on my right. But obviously, if you change directions and you're going downstream, now that red should be on my left because the reds are always on the same side of the waterway. They don't change yeah. sides, but you need to know which side of those to be on because that's going to be the safest part of the water. That's going to be the safest depth where you're not going to damage a boat. You're not going to hit rock or, you know, things like that. So it's it's very critical that you know where to stay in the waterway. So that's just one example of what you do learn in those those safety courses. Well, well and, and I mentioned that because it brings me to my next uh, sort of question about boat safety because – uh, you know, when I learned that, one of the things that I did, what I realized then is what those buoys do is they mark the, we call it the safe water channel or the deep water channel or whatever you would. would. That's, that's where we know that you should be able to operate your boat without worrying about it. But there are still a lot of, uh, sort of let's call them obstacles in the water. So well, what are the things that you need to look for when you're out there on the water that, that, you know, okay, is the water always safe, but maybe not? What do you have to watch for? Yeah, so here's what's interesting. I mean, a lot of people, you would assume, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm 100 yards from this shoreline and 100 yards from that shoreline, surely I'm in deep enough water. The way, you know, everybody kind of looks at it as if it's a it's a V. I mean, the the bottom of the lake just gets deeper as you go to, towards the center of it. That's not the case though. I mean, it's uh it, you know, our waterways here for the most part are flooded land. They're not necessarily natural uh, rivers, so they've been dammed up and and carried beyond the the banks of the original river, and they've covered up you know hills and and mountains and trees and you know different things. Where just because you're you're in the middle of the water doesn't mean anything really, because you can be in the middle of the water and be in in three feet of water and then be fifty feet from the shoreline and be in ninety feet of water. So you can't use that that assumption. So that's what those those reds and greens mark, like you said, is that safe deep water. They're kind of like the stripes on the road. Um, they, they mark each side of the road where you're safe, where you where you need to stay. Um, you're going to venture outside of those uh, a lot of times to go into a cove or you know different areas. But you really need to be you know navigating within those markers. And if you're not within those markers, you need to make sure that you're using a, a you know, some sort of navigation tool, whether it be an app. Uh, there's an app called Navionics uh, that you can use that shows you. It's a chart of the, the waterway and shows you depths and, and things like that. So, yeah. So, that you know, it's yeah. just because you're in the middle doesn't mean you're safe. That's very cool. And, and actually, I have that Navionics app on my phone. Uh, and when we go out on the water, uh, I, I love it. It's, it's great. It, it shows me exactly what's happening around me in, in terms of the water and its depth and those sorts of things. I love it. It shows me where the channel is. It's a really cool tool. Um, so, all right, so I get that figured out. But, you know, the other thing I've learned is that uh, the, the water is not always uh, clean. And when I say clean, I'm not necessarily talking about you – know, there, there might be some trash in the water and things like that, but that's not my concern. Uh, there are other things in the water that I need to be worried about as a boater. And so talk to me a little bit about that, Scott. What are, what are the sort of unique things that we need to watch for in our rivers and lakes when we're out there boating? Yeah, like you said, I mean, you, you're you not just looking at, because you can't see through the water, obviously. You don't know what's underneath. And, and as I stated before, I mean, you, you've got areas that were were flooded and you've got trees that are that are underneath the surface. You've got rock formations. You've got things that, like I said, you may be 200 yards from the shoreline and it's six inches deep in that area because yeah. it was a in the topography it was a high spot so you're looking out for for those obstacles that are in the water i mean you've got your your communication markers or your warning buoys that kind of tell you about 
a lot of those things, but a lot of them, actually more of them are not marked. I mean, they're not marked as to to a high spot or where you may high center a boat or run a boat aground. Um, so you're you're always looking out for those things. And as you said, debris, um, of course, we're, you know, Fort Loudon is, is the Tennessee River. Um, so you've always got debris moving through. You need to know how to spot for that, how to navigate around that, how to handle that. So there's a lot of things to be watching out for when you're operating that boat. Yeah, I get that completely. Cool. All right. So listen, we we are we have uh, we have enough time to take one more break uh, this morning uh, before we get into our final segment. Uh, when we come back from this break, we're going to finish up our conversation about safety. I have a couple more questions there, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what are the best places to go have fun on the lake with your boat. Uh, you are listening to More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI, and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. You're listening to More Living on 98.7 WOKI. I'm Kevin Fregenbrink, your host for today, filling in for Jim Brogan. I'm talking with Scott Payne about the lake, and I'm having a great time doing it. A uh, couple of quick uh, safety questions to wrap up with here, Scott. Uh, the first one is this. You know, Scott, if people like to get out on the lake and have an adult beverage or two. Uh, it's always a little bit risky, but tell us, what are the rules about alcohol and the boat? Yeah, so as you said, boating and, and having a beer or having a glass of wine tend to go hand in hand. And, and you know, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but you have to watch, you know, the, the level of consumption. A lot of people are confused and in in thinking that, you know, because a boat is not a vehicle that you're driving down the road, that, that, that the rules don't apply. But what's interesting is that it's really the same requirement. I mean, blood alcohol content of 0.08 or more is considered legally intoxicated. So when you're driving a boat and your blood alcohol content is that or higher, you're legally intoxicated. So, you know, your your yeah. policing authorities, PWRA or, or the sheriff or whoever it may be, can stop you. Just like you're driving a car, they can give you a sobriety test, breathalyzer, you know, whatever it may be. And if you, you know, are over that blood alcohol content, they can impound the boat. It's a $2,500 fine, first offense. I think it goes first two to three offenses. It goes up, you know, 5000 I think, on the third offense. So there's there's some, you know, some consequences to that consumption. But the other thing you have to take in, into account is that, you know, when you're sitting at a barbecue or, or sitting in your, your kitchen or at the dinner table having a glass of wine, you don't have those external influences that you have when you're out on the water. You've got, you've got the heat of the sun. You're getting dehydrated, so alcohol is going to affect you much more than what it does when you're sitting in your air-conditioned living room. You've got the motion of the boat moving around. You've got a, you know, just a lot of factors that can make you know, that, uh, that influence so much stronger on the water. So th- you know, three beers on, on the back porch under, in the shade compared to three beers on a boat, they're two different things. I mean, the, the influence yeah. is... Yeah. It, the studies show it's naturally higher when you're on the water. Yeah, so something very important to keep keep an eye on your alcohol consumption while you're out on the boat for sure, uh, which leads me to my last uh, safety question for this morning, um, life jacket. So so you did say early on that, you know, when you, when you get your boat, you have to have at least – you at least have to have life jackets on board for everybody uh, who's going to be on board, enough, to, enough for everybody to use. But but who who's supposed to wear them? Do you have to have life jackets on? Are you required? What what's the rule? Yeah, so so in the state of Tennessee and really pretty much every state, anyone twelve years of age or younger must have a Coast Guard approved life jacket or PFD on their body, strapped on correctly at all times that the boat is moving and not moored or anchored off. So if they're under the age of thirteen they must have that that safety vest on. Obviously, if you're above the age of 13, by law, you don't have to have it on. You know, I always advise our our members and and other boaters, you know, always ask those questions of, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, your guests that are coming on board, on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, how well can you swim? How comfortable are you around the water? 
because we all know that there's, you know, 50 year olds that can't swim and you'd, you, right. you'd be so much better off to, to make sure they've got a vest on. Cause you just never know what's going to happen. You, you're dodging a piece of debris in the water and somebody goes overboard and they can't swim. You know, you, you, you need to make sure they've got a vest on, but I would advise, you know, when you buy your boat, um, get, get the safety packs of vest, your orange, I call them goober vest, but, uh, they're your safety vest that, that you know that you have on board for the capacity of your boat. So if your boat is the capacity of 12 men, put 12 of those suckers on there so that you know you're yeah. always covered. But you do have to, your yeah. your kids, remember, have to be wearing them. Got it. Got it. Well, that's important to know. All right. So listen, uh, Scott, you are, you're calling in today uh, from the On the Water Boat Show at Teleco Marina. Uh, tell us, tell us a little bit about that boat show. You just got a couple of minutes here. Just give me a quick overview of what's going on at the boat show this weekend. Yeah. So like you said, Kevin, we're right at Teleco Marina. They, uh, this is an on the water boat show. So a lot of your boat shows you go and they're sitting on trailers in a, in a, you know, a conference hall or something like that. Well, out here, these dealers have got them on the water so they can do some, uh, some test driving. You've got some booths out here for, for like life apparel, for shirts, for hats. You've got, uh, boaters insurance booth out here. You've got boat financing out here. You've got, I think, some dock builders out here. So you got a lot of uh, kind of covering the, the water life out here at the show. And it, it's gonna, it is from 10 to 4 o'clock today. So it, it's, a, it's a good place to kind of come out and, and learn and, and just get info on Lake Watt. Cool. And it's at, it's at Teleco Marina, uh, 10 to 4. It's today only. Is that right? That that is correct, Kevin, and 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 it's that Teleco Marina is just off of uh, 411 and 72, kind of out in the Benor area. Gotcha. All right, very cool. All right, so that that's excellent. I hope some people get to get out there and do that. Uh, so tell me this real quick. Uh, where what's what's the what are your favorite places to go on the lake? Uh, yeah, you're you're going out on the lake yourself uh, this afternoon. Where are you going to go? Yeah, so we're we're uh, my family and I. We love to to wake surf, so we love to find a you know a quiet cove, especially if it's the afternoon. Man, you're going to have more boats out there. You want to find a you know a a quiet cove or even a cove. You know, when you get off in a cove, a lot of times you don't have the debris and stuff that you're dodging all the time, so you can find a, a safer spot. I mean, we love to uh, you know close to the club work Concord Marina for one of them, um, Turkey Creek or. You know, to be honest with you, my best time or favorite time to get out on the water is in the morning because you don't have as many boats out there. You've kind of got the lake to yourself. You don't necessarily have to worry about getting into a cove. We also like, you know, yep. finding the swimming hole, cliffs to jump off of, all, all that fun stuff. So there's just so much on these lakes that you can find, just peaceful spots to hang out. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it's awesome. I, I got to tell you. Since I joined the boat club two years ago, I've spent more time on the lake than I ever have in my life, and I have loved it. And so uh, we're getting close to the end of our time here this morning. Before we get totally finished up, Scott, I do want to give you an opportunity. If people want to know more about the boat club, how do they how do they learn about that? How do they get in touch with you? What do they do? Yeah, so you can always visit our, our website, which is nauticalboatclub.com. We've got locations at Concord Marina on Fort Loudon. We've got a location out here at Teleco Marina on Teleco, you know, about 20 minutes from Teleco Village. Um, you can, our phone number here at the club or either club is 865-234-0000. You know, we've got a fleet of boats that our members have access to, water toys. We make it easy. I mean, take care of the maintenance, the upkeep, the cleaning, and get, get them on the water. That's, that's what we love to do. Beautiful. Hey, thank you, Scott, for being my guest on the show today. I'm excited to get back out on the lake maybe uh, sometime this weekend or certainly in the next few weeks. Everybody go out there and stay safe on the lake. And tune in next week at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. for another segment of More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 FM WOKI. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.